Greetings friends and welcome to this very spooky Halloween edition of Breakfast in the Ruins which sees the triumphant return of Phil after a year and we're going to be looking at the Guy and Smith classic Night of the Crabs. Now Phil and I talked about this for quite a while and it's quite a long episode so I'm not going to go into any great details or any great general flim flam or chicanery in this introduction about the origins of Night of the Crabs or indeed the career of Guy and Smith because actually we'll be following that up in a wee while with a conversation with our very own Graham aka Open Sussex where we will talk about the career and life of Guy and Smith and his varied output from children's books to weird Japanese exploitation prisoner of war fiction all the way through of course to his more classically recognised horror output, foremost of which is Night of the Crabs, but it also includes various other bits and pieces, which these days are actually quite hard to find, and actually go for quite a few bob. But, less of my yakking, you may tell, I've had quite a few spooky Halloween white Russians. We're going to skip the preamble, and we're going to get right into Night of the Crabs by Guy and Smith. back in a very spooky Derry and Tom's for this Halloween special episode and I can't believe it Phil it's been a year since our last Halloween episode which actually means it's been a year since the last time you were on the show. Have we not done one since? We haven't done one since I don't think. Wow that has passed. Yeah it has hasn't it. So it's about time we pulled our fingers out. Now you know we have been reading City of the Beast um, aka Warriors of Mars but my copies kept disintegrating didn't they? So we've um, we've put that on hold for now, and we're going to do, as selected by the patrons and voted for, we're going to do Night of the Crabs by Guy N. Smith. But before we kick off, we've prepared the way with, what was it, a vampire martini? A vampire kiss. A vampire kiss. Tell us what was in a vampire kiss. It was very delicious. So it started with some vodka, and then for the, obviously, blood... They said something like chambord or a cassie. Mm -hmm. So we had some cassie that I found in the cupboard, followed up with some champagne. Mm. And it was delicious. It was. And I've got a nice, warm, rosy glow as a result. However, I've prepared our next drink for, uh, for, for this part, and I've prepared us a very, very spooky white Russian. Now, what's spooky about it? Well, we better, we'll better have a taste, don't we? Okay. Woo! Mm. I think you've detected what's spooky about it. It's I put strong. twice as much vodka in. <laughs> I'm sure that's cheating. <laughs> because we didn't have any pumpkin spice or any of these weird hipster things to make uh, a proper spooky Halloween uh, white Russian. I just I just swung for the fences. Although I did put some some cocoa bitters in, right. so that's slightly different as well, and some mini twirls, <laughs> which with mine have sunk to the bottom now. But anyway, let's have another slow than that. I'm just trying to overthink how the twirls make it spooky. <laughs> I don't know. The, 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 the clog up your straw and make you choke. <laughs> so you have to go careful. So we decided, uh, well actually the patrons decided that we would cover Night of the Crabs. And this may well become a tradition over the years because of last, last year, of course, we covered uh, the rats, didn't we? Which is very enjoyable, especially as we'd both read it as young adults, mm. well, teenagers, and, uh, yes, it was very, very interesting to go back. Mm. And uh, I think the listeners enjoyed it very much. So it was plainly obvious that when we came to do a Halloween special again, that we should do some kind of, well, not necessarily cheesy 70s or 80s horror paperback shenanigans. Because actually we put some quite different things in there. We put some William Hope Hodgson in the poll. We put Arthur Merkin in the poll. But the top two picks were the winner, Night of the Crabs, and second place, The Fog, which was your favoured preference. Yeah, wasn't it? which I did. And to be fair, I've never read any guy in Smith before this. And I did I did get a lot out of it, I have to admit. Yeah, yeah. well, we'll talk about that as we go along. But as it happens, we were on holiday in Markham, weren't we, when we actually put the poll out. 
and you actually picked up a copy <laughs> of The Fog in anticipation, a spare copy, so we've got two kicking around. I found it second-hand in this uh, market, and I'm like, maybe this will encourage people to vote for it, but I lost. <laughs> it didn't. And in the end, it was a two-horse race between Night of the Crabs and The Fog, but the final analysis was Night of the Crabs got twice as many votes as The Fog did. Yeah. However, at least we have a copy of The Fog each if we decide to go ahead and do it. Absolutely. And who knows? Maybe, as a follow-up to this, we might just do the fog anyway and put it out as a patron extra or yeah. something. Why not? Can't hurt, can it? But we're here for Night of the Crabs. So I've, I've got my uh, New English Library, very, very good condition, actually, New English Library edition of Night of the Crabs, and um, it's got the wonderful cover with the crab on the Danger Keep Out sign on the sands, which I think you've got as well. But you've got a Black Hill Books edition, which I believe was a reprint run which were actually done by Guy and Smith himself via his website. Um, nice clean copy, nice and pristine. And just for everybody's uh, benefit, we will probably do a, a random selection of a patron at the end of this discussion. And one of these copies will be winging its way to a patron so someone else can, can enjoy and share in the love. But first of all, let's, let's just read what, what's on the back. The Welsh coast basks in summer tranquillity. Then the drownings begin. Drownings, mm. quotes, <laughs> bunny ears. But not until the monstrous crustaceans crawl ashore, their pincers poised for destruction, does the world understand the threat it faces. Um, by threat, they generally mean North Wales, I think. Um, <laughs> and then it says, a seafood cocktail for the strongest stomachs. Well, with a write-up like that, how could you possibly avoid it? And amazingly, and I've absolutely no idea why, but when I think back to when I was reading things like The Rats and Sven Hassel and all these garishly covered books from back in the day, Guy and Smith completely passed me by. I remember seeing the covers. Yeah. But to me, Guy and Smith covers always felt a little bit like seeing a Leo Kessler cover in a bookshop. It always felt like a cheap knockoff of James Herbert. Now... Fair or unfair, we'll probably talk about mm. that, because I think probably, on reflection after reading this, I would probably put Sean Hudson third on the list for the crit Critter books as the cheap knockoff of James Herbert and maybe even Guy and Smith himself. We'll probably talk about Sean Hudson a little bit further down the line, just like we did with the Rats episode. So yeah, let's crack into Night of the Crabs. So, chapter one, we meet Ian and Julie and we get a little bit of a kind of a, a a slightly different take on the classic Jaws beginning of young man, young lady, go swimming. Difference between, in, in Jaws, the poor lad is too pissed to get his shoes off and doesn't actually go swimming, so the girl goes swimming on her own. But we meet Ian and Julie. Can I just say that when setting the scene, and I think what instantly made me go, I'm going to enjoy this, is because it was set by the sea mm. and coming from a coastal town, as we both have mm -hmm. i was kind of happy i liked the scene and i was instantly there yeah yeah well they're uh they're on the welsh coast on this occasion so we meet ian and julie and very very quickly we find out a little bit about ian and julie but not only that about the protagonist of the actual book penny for your thoughts the attractive red-haired freckled first girl dressed in jeans and sweater nudged him in the ribs with her elbow she was roughly the same age as himself and her slim perfectly proportioned figure had already caused many a male holidaymaker to glance in her direction. Nothing much, he smiled back at her. I was only thinking how nice it would be to spend another week here instead of going back to London on Saturday. Well, she wrinkled her nose, I must say I agree, but I don't think your Uncle Cliff would. He'd be the first to blow his top if we didn't turn up at the laboratory on Monday morning. Dear old Uncle Cliff, Ian laughed. Not so much of the old, Julie slipped an arm around his waist. He may be one of the country's leading botanists, but he isn't even forty yet. He's very much your mother's younger brother. Oh, you're right, he inside. Cliff's almost like a brother to me. And he's hip, too, to quote a modern phrase. He didn't even raise an eyebrow when he discovered that we were going away together for a week. Have a good dirty week, he said, as I left on Friday night. I don't expect you'll be good, but try and be careful. I don't want Julie to have to pack up work just yet. <laughs> you wouldn't find many uncles taking that attitude. So th that, that's our first introduction to Cliff. Cliff Davenport, the, the protagonist of this novel. The hip Cliff Davenport. 
Which you have to remember, it was it was written in seventy six. Yeah, and I think that some of the sexist <laughs> undertones <laughs> about having to give up work and just yeah, yeah, just a few. You have to say it was written in seventy six. Yeah, well, th- th- there are, there are a couple of really choice bits in this first paragraph, this, this first chapter, which um, which place it as family in the seventies. Anyway, let's let's get to that when we get to it. So <laughs> they decide they're going to go swimming, and we get our first mention of the Shell Island military base. So they're off swimming around Shell Island, and there's this um, extensive barbed wire fence around a war department base. And he says, uh, "War department." Ian said as he slowed down. Uncle Cliff told me all about it when he heard we were coming here. It's a pilotless aircraft base. See those small planes over there? Will they fly them by remote control? All very hush hush though. You'll need a war department pass in triplicate to even get as far as the first checkpoint. Uncle Cliff said some lads who were camping on Shell Island went on an exploration trip one night and ran into the guards. They nearly got shot, and then had to undergo an extensive interrogation before they were allowed to leave with severe warnings ringing in their ears. So we're setting the scene now. So we're on the Welsh coast. We've got Uncle Cliff, Cliff Davenport, who we'll find out a little bit more about shortly. We've got Ian and Julie, who are going swimming, and they're going swimming near... A secret military base. And the word drones isn't used. But well done, Guy and Smith, for predicting drone air bases. Yeah, and you're instantly thinking, oh, secret military base. Yeah. Is this what led to what we're going to read? Yeah, and I, th- I think we'll probably touch on it a little bit more because we do get a bit more of the military base. But then it kind of vanishes from the book halfway through and we never hear of it again. It's like a, it's, it's, it's a dangling thread that's left and never followed up on. But anyway... So the ghost women, and Ian finds that Julie is a much stronger swimmer than she, swimmer than she is. <laughs> this is a brilliant bit. Where it says, uh, Julie Coles was a strong swimmer too. She even matched Ian for speed. And he, after ten minutes or so, there were still a good fifty yards between them. Of course, she had a good start on him. He increased his efforts, clawing the salt water as he strove to narrow the distance. Ten minutes or so later, he paused. Damn these waves. He couldn't see her. Turn, you fool, turn, he swore inwardly. We're far enough out to sea. Still... She persevered with a direct course. Stupid bitch! Yeah. <laughs> you gasp aloud. You'll be too far out. I did think <laughs> that's a bit strong. Going from a bit irritable. <laughs> now, my first concern, if you were swimming out to sea, would be worry yeah. that you were going to get carried off by the waves. <laughs> Not stupid bitch. That yeah. kind of says competitive. It's just su- such a brilliant image. He's, like, he's, he's really cheesed off because she's a better swimmer than him. And once he starts to struggle, he's just like treading water, gasping. You stupid bitch. <laughs> um, but th- they never really get a chance to kind of fall out over it because shortly later he hears a screaming. And to cut a very long story short, they both uh, get bits snipped off them and die horribly threshing around in the water, which is a, a terrible, terrible death. It is, and then obviously we go, we cut, we cut to Uncle Cliff Davenport in his laboratory, waiting for them to turn up for work. We do, and uh, there are certain tasks that he's got, got got to attend to before they arrive at nine, so he's expecting them, and there we find out if there is uh, there is lab assistants, we find out a little bit about him. He says, as he worked, the botanist caught a glimpse of his re- reflection in the water. He smiled. At least he didn't think that he looked any older. Those lines in his lean, aquiline face marked the passing of his dear wife. They could never be erased, like his memory of her. His receding hairline and the odd flecks of grey in his dark hair were all that denoted his age. His lithe figure was as sprightly as ever, and the pipe, drooping out of the corner of his mouth, reminded him of the time when he had portrayed Sherlock Holmes in a local amateur dramatic society's presentation of The Speckled Band. Nice, so, I like that. Yeah, so he, sh- he should be he should be right on your top list because he looks like Sherlock Holmes. He's played Sherlock Holmes in uh, in an amateur dramatic society, um, and then it says his task completed. He retired to his study. There he poured himself a cup of black coffee and relit his pipe. He felt vaguely hungry, but he knew that Julie would automatically prepare him something to eat once she and Ian arrived. Yeah. Yeah, Julie. Like once again. <laughs> know your place, Julie. Get my dinner on. Yeah, if you got pregnant, who would make my sandwiches? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, don't want to lose it too quickly. Mm. I do like the fact he's got a pipe as well, which you just don't hear anymore. Well, it might not surprise you to learn, but if you see a photograph of Guy and Smith, he's got quite aquiline features and he smokes a pipe. Really? Yes, he does. So the uh, idea that in this yeah. Cliff Devonport is this like sort of hardcore mensch of a guy 
who also, as we find out, is almost irresistible to any random stray woman who t- stays in the same B&B as him. <laughs> There's no wonder, because this is maybe a projection of Guy and Smith himself. But anyway, Julie and Ian don't turn up, and he gets impatient, and uh, two coppers turn up, and uh, they have some grave news for him. They found Ian's car. And there's no sign of them, but they did find their clothes. So Cliff is uh, he's taken aback. He says, impossible. His dry croak lacked convi- conviction. But the police tell him, he says, the two policemen stepped outside into the bright sunlight. Both heaved sighs of relief. It had been easier than they had anticipated. The professor had taken the news admirably. What were they expecting him to do? <laughs> I don't know. That was the bit I was like, I don't get that. But the key part is, Cliff Davenport takes bad news admirably. Yeah. That's all we need to know. And says, <laughs> Inside the house, Cliff Davenport stood with his back to the closed door. He knew in his heart that he would never see either Ian Wright or Julie Coles again. And this is this is the first instance, really, of something which happens repeatedly throughout the book. Whenever there's any reference to Cliff, it's always Cliff Davenport. <sighs> that's a really unusual thing. Isn't it? But the thing is, we say that and we talked about it and it, and it's like, why do you keep using the full names? But occasionally he uses just Cliff. Yeah. And occasionally it's Professor Davenport. And it's like, I don't understand yeah. why he keeps. Yeah. I do, I do struggle with that, I have to say. Yeah. I, I just find it amusing. I find it amusing. It, it becomes kind of... It reinforces its amusement as it goes along because Cliff Davenport is not just Cliff. Cliff is Cliff Davenport. And Cliff Davenport is towering, a towering man. <laughs> He's a towering protagonist. So chapter two starts. Cliff Davenport remained at his West Hampstead home for three days. He did no work and he ate little. Can I just butt in? I have to butt in. Yep. When I read that line, I was like, that's because there was no Julie that's there. That's because Julie's not him. there to make his breakfast. <laughs> So he did no work and he ate little. He consumed on average an ounce of tobacco a day. There's a lot of tobacco. Yeah. He consumed on average an ounce of tobacco a day. Those lines on his face deepened. He was hardened to grief, but it was the very fact of not knowing that troubled him. If Ian and Julie were dead, then for a short while he would succumb to grief. If they were discovered alive, then he would rejoice. Until then, he would endure untold mental agony. But there is more grief because he kept saying, didn't he? Or he said they're both strong swimmers. He knew they were both strong swimmers. Yeah. He knew about the currents. It just, yeah. Yeah. He knew things weren't right. Yeah. But at least if he knows, he can some. He, he can just for a short while succumb to grief because he's Cliff Davenport, and Cliff Davenport <laughs> won't succumb to grief for a long time, <laughs> only a short time. So anyway, he rings the police headquarters at Harlech, and the answer is repeatedly the same. The police are no help. He gets repeatedly frustrated by the police not having any news for him. I think, they're, I think they're getting a bit frustrated of him ringing every day. Yeah, to be fair, I'd probably get a bit fed up of him. Just a quick point on Harlock. Harlock's where we've got our amazing cast iron kitchen skills. Is it? Yeah, do you remember? We went to Port Merion. Oh. I, still, I still use them. Yeah, so we've been to Harlock. I don't think there's a police station there now. But anyway, um, so sick of waiting on the old bill, Cliff packs a bag, gets in his Cortina estate. Fucking beautiful. Nice period detail. And heads off to take matters into his own hands because... It's just what Cliff Davenport does, isn't it? <laughs> he takes matter into his own hands, as we find out repeatedly. Yes. So he went to Lam... How do you say it? Lambedra? Clambear. Lambert? Clambear. Well, um, we do have some uh, some Welsh listeners. They'll have to correct us on this. Please. And it, to be fair, it's not really um, unusual for us to really badly pronounce things on this show. Yeah, so he, he, he goes to a hotel in Lambert. He says it's not a hotel as such. Few holidaymakers were aware of its existence, and the friendly widowed Mrs. Jones preferred to keep it that way. She had a regular guest who returned year after year, and that was how she wanted it. So he has a little bit of exchange. He calls her mum. He says, hello, mum. Do you some... question? Because I question why. I, th- I think that's that's kind of kind of quite an old school thing. I, r- I remember seeing that in like old um, TV shows and films, where... A character would refer to an old man as dad. They go, hello, dad, or hello, mum. I think, I think it's kind of an yeah, old school yeah. thing. She obviously doesn't mind. She seems quite... She obviously has a soft spot for him. Yeah. And uh, he explains that the missing couple who are in the news are his, uh, his nephew and the girl who is his fiancée. 
And Mrs. Jones sits down suddenly on the nearest chair and says, I didn't know. I'm terribly sorry, Professor. You were to know, the Professor smiled wanly. But it's almost a week now since they disappeared. And everybody seems to have abandoned the search, content just to let the tide wash them up in its own time. Well, I'm not satisfied that everything's just as it should be. I intend to perk around a bit. I don't know what it is, but I've got a funny feeling that there's more to this than meets the eye. I also know in my own mind that they're both dead. Grimly, he continued drinking his tea. And obviously, uh, Mrs. Jones had said it was, you know, it was people going out swimming, the, the currents get too strong. And obviously that's the local view of it, which is why he made it clear yeah. that they were both strong swimmers and knew that there wasn't a lot of currents in that area. Mm, yeah. So af- after grimly drinking tea, he, he, <laughs> he lords it over a police sergeant again and then heads to the beaches of Shell Island because he's taking Matt's family into his own hands now. He's not Matt. He's not mucking about. The following morning, after breakfast, Cliff went on to Shell Island. He went on foot, feeling it hardly worth the trouble of taking the car from Mrs. Jones's place to the south end of the island, a journey of possibly two miles. It was a bright sunny morning, and had it not been for the sense of foreboding which clouded his mind, he would have entered into the spirit of a holiday maker. His binoculars slung over his shoulders and carrying a long stick of ash, a favourite companion on long hikes, he strode along. He obviously liked his walks. He did. He, he reminds me of Keith in Nuts in May. You remember the Mike Lee film? Come along, Candice Marie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he, there's a little bit of that going on with Pat later on. Yeah. Yeah. After being buzzed by a drone, sorry, an unmanned aircraft, he just randomly finds giant crab tracks and gets excited. So excited, he just spouts exposition out loud to himself. My God, he gasped, so excited that the words poured out aloud. They're all along the tide line. Claw marks. But what in the name of heaven could have left a print that size? It's, it's like a crab. Only dozens of them, and a hundred times as big. Impossible. Impossible. <laughs> um, so he, he has a good examination, and he's, he's, uh, he's completely um, bemused. And uh, it says, Cliff knew he had no alternative other than to retreat from the tide. He had seen these bizarre crazy marks with his own eyes, and now they were being removed. The evidence was disappearing. If only he had brought a camera. But no one would believe him now. So he's getting buzzed by pilotless aircraft. Well, he... he kn- in his head, he knows it's crabs, but he sees those drones. He wants to find a different explanation for the mm. marks because they're not normal crab size. Yeah. So he thinks, oh, could it be them? Could there be something on their undercarriage that's caused the marks on the sand? Yeah, yeah. So um, he's, he's uh, not one to bow down to authority. He's got a hunch to check out. He says, for some reason, the visits to the island seem to keep well clear of the WD compound, the War Department compound. Perhaps they felt it was not in keeping with the relaxation which they sought, or maybe they had an inbuilt fear of military authority. Cliff Davenport was not one of the latter. (laughs) At that moment, he cared neither for authority nor the scenic beauty. All he knew was that he had to take a closer look at one of those pilotless aircraft, paying particular attention to its undercarriage. The discovery of some unorthodox landing device would ease his troubled mind somewhat. When he was within 50 yards of the nearest barbed wire fence, he saw the guard. The man was dressed in RAF uniform and had his back to the professor. Cliff noted with a faint tingling of his spine that he carried a rifle. He did not doubt that it was loaded and that the sentry would use it at the first threat to security. So yeah, have um, classic RAF base guard. See something unusual, shoot it. <laughs> but he's not bound down to no uniforms anyway, so not for long anyway. He does a bit of spying on the base and dispels his idea that perhaps aircraft undercarriage was responsible for the giant crab tracks. But he does get rumbled by the guards in RAF Blue well, and, and gets thrown into Cherokee. You have to say, right, you've got this fenced compound. It's a war department, you know that. So it'll have all the private land keep-off stuff. Yeah. He sees a guard and rather than going up to them and saying, I've seen some strange marks, you know, does do your drones have some... No, no, he gets down into the long grass yeah. with his binoculars. Yeah. If anything looked more... Dubious. Suspicious. Yes, suspicious. Yeah. And he's just like, you idiot. Yeah. But he's Cliff Davenport and he ploughs his own furrow because that is what Cliff Davenport does. Uh-huh. So anyway, chapter three, he's been, uh, he's been banged up in some stuffy room on the base and uh, he's getting interrogated by some, uh, uh, some sinister suits, but he manages to pull a rabbit out the hat and because he's Cliff Davenport, and he's already been intimidate, intimidating the old Bill, and he's already intimidated a poor police sergeant in uh, in Harlock. Well, now 
you can intimidate the faceless, sinister suit on the secret base. Myers cough. Yes, that's right. And he intimidates Myerko. Myers cough. Myers cough. Myerko. Myerko. Myers cough. Okay. What? Uh, whatever. Let's call him Myers cough. So he intimidates Myers Koff because he's met with some knob in Whitehall. And this is our first reference that we get to uh, t- to Grisdale. Yeah, name dropping. Name dropping. Yeah, so, so like an absolute wanker, he name drops his top mate in Whitehall. Sir Ronald Bradley? I thought it was Grisdale who he, who he name drops. No, My no. My God. Name drops Sir Ronald Bradley. Oh, that's right, he does. Yeah. So Grisdale must come into the situation a little bit further on the line then. Yeah. So he says to this, he says to my he says, Sergeant Hughes of your local force knows me, Cliff replied. Failing that, I must refer you to let's say Ronald Bradley of Whitehall, who is a personal friend of mine. I take it you've heard of him. The professor felt a sudden surge of hope as surprise registered for a brief second on that deadpan face. A brief flicker and it was gone. Then, a decisive move. The receiver of the telephone on the desk was lifted and a long slender forefinger began to dial. A brief pause. The ringing of the phone on the other end of the line could be heard. Burr, burr, burr. Burr, burr, burr. <laughs> on and on it went. Nobody seemed in a hurry. Nobody moved. At last, there was a distant crackling and a voice was speaking. The words were inaudible. Sir Ronald? There was no even a note of respect in the grim-faced man's tone. A relaxing of tension. My car here, sir. Shell Island. Do you know Professor Davenport? Silence again, except for a jumble of distant conversation. Myers Co. listened intently. A frown appeared on his face. One of disappointment. Yes. Yes, Sir Ronald. He was almost humble now. Your description fits in perfectly. No, no, sir. I'll take your word for it. There appears to have been some mistake. Yes, yes, of course, sir. I'm sorry to have troubled you. And then they just let him go. So, Do you think his description included a pipe? Yeah, probably. <laughs> he's got aquiline features and smokes a pipe. And he's irresistible to random recently divorced women. We haven't got that. Oh, yeah, we haven't got that yet, have we? <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, it's all a bit of a coincidence, that. But you know what, Cliff Davenport, all we know is Cliff Davenport's connected. Why? Because Cliff Davenport is connected. And that's all we need to know. Yeah. So, he's pulled the rabbit out of his hat. He's got back. And he gets back to the boarding house and, oh, hello, Totty. <laughs> Totty in the boarding house. Well, he's so busy because he got back so late having been kept captive there. And it's like, Mrs Jones, would you mind sitting with this woman? She's recently, her, her husband left her. He was such a rotter, but uh, <laughs> I think you'll get on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> It's brilliant. Ah, oh, Professor, said Mrs. Jones as she suddenly emerged from the kitchen. There you are. I was getting a bit worried about you when you didn't come into lunch. I had a lot of ground to cover. He shook his head sadly. <laughs> I'm afraid we're a bit pushed for room. Mrs. Jones leaned close so that she would not be heard by the other guests. I know you won't mind sharing a table. There's a Mrs. Benson over there in the corner. Her husband left her last year. A real rotter he was too. I'm sure you'll like her. I'm sure I will, Cliff replied. <laughs> His eyes were already on the dark-haired petite girl who sipped tomato juice, a wistful expression on her face. She was wearing a cotton blouse above a tartan skirt, and he saw the outline of small, firm breasts. It wasn't often these days he noticed such things. He put her age at about 25. I was going to say, really? It's not often you notice? <laughs> yeah. First time you go out of your lab? Yeah. You're describing pert breasts? Yeah. Hello, Professor, she greeted him, smiling up at him as he paused nervously at the table. I've been hearing all about you from Mrs. Jones. Please <laughs> sit down. Maker. My name's Pat. So, bingo. He meets Pat Benson. And we hear that her name is Pat Benson quite a lot. Yeah. So he sits down, offloads on her. <laughs> what a day he's had. <laughs> what a day. Offloads about his dead nephew and his dead fiance, dead nephew's fiance. And wouldn't you know it, she's seen the crab tracks too. What a coincidence. What this a this coincidence. is all just so easy for Cliff Davenport. It's just so easy. Suddenly, her hand rested on his as though such contact was the most natural thing in the world. He noticed subconsciously the mark where she'd once worn a ring on the third finger of her left hand. I won't ridicule you, Cliff. She smiled, and he felt a staring within himself that he'd almost forgotten existed. <laughs> Suppose we team up, do some investigating. I've nothing else to do. I came here to try and forget. Start life all over again. 
I'll help you to search for Ian and Julie too. He felt his eyes misting over. Thank you. He glanced away automatically so that she would not see his emotions, his weaknesses. I'd... I'd be glad of that. Suppose we bathe together tomorrow. No, no, we'd better keep clear of the water. It's too dangerous until we know. We must explore the beach and look for more signs. Fine. She squeezed his hand and rose to her feet. See you at breakfast in the morning, then. It's just wonderful. It's like, just instantly, instantly in. And the fact that because she saw the marks as well, they both agree. It must be monster crabs. Yeah, so. yeah, it must be. And the next paragraph is absolutely amazing. So paragraph break, following morning. Both Cliff Davenport and Pat Benson <laughs> rose late the following morning. Most of the other guests had already breakfasted and departed by the time they sat down and made a start on their respective melons. <laughs> That's just so awesome, it's isn't just, it? It's absolutely uh, brilliant. Their respective melons. So in the 70s, was that the start of a breakfast? You'd start with a melon. Yeah. All I remember of weird 70s breakfasts is just odd adverts with half a grapefruit with a pill on it. <gasps> yeah. Do you remember those adverts? Yes, I do. What the fuck was that all about? Half half of a grapefruit yeah. with a pill on it. I can't remember. I can't remember either. But I remember the adverts. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm I'm kind of a di- I'm, although I find it hugely amusing I'm disappointed in a way it says by the time it doesn't say by the time they sat down and made a start on their respective half grapefruits with pills on. I must say in, in the seventies, it was grapefruit in Grimsby. Yeah, yeah. You know what? If any listeners can enlighten us to why we both have memories of half grapefruits with pills on from the late seventies or early eighties, please for fuck's sake, put us out of our misery. <laughs> But anyway, while while they're um, while they're eating their respective melons, <laughs> they're also checking out the newspaper, and and there's a headline of a newspaper on an adjacent table, and it catches his eye. It says "Bathers missing off Welsh coast," and he snatches up the paper with trembling hands, almost knowing what he was about to read. Following the disappearance of two swimmers off Shell Island last weekend, further people have been reported missing at Both, Fairborn, and Barmouth late yesterday afternoon. Extensive searches are still going on, but none of the five people have been recovered. Experts believe that dangerous currents have appeared in these waters and have claimed unwary swimmers. My God! Cliff exclaimed. Take a look at this, he said, passing the newspaper across to Pat Benson. (laughs) It's already begun. The crabs are attacking. I love that line. It's already begun. It's already begun. The The crabs crabs are are attacking. attacking. But, you know what, It's, it's a bit of a leaf, Cliff Davenport, but let's go with it. Because he's Cliff Davenport and we've just got to trust him. Because, after all, he is Cliff Davenport. Before you start chapter four, yeah, I don't know if it's me as you start to read, but, oh my God, how quick is this? That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. Chapter four, to be honest, is just pure, pure Garth Marenghi. Well, they went to the beach hand in hand. Yeah. They met the night before. Yeah. So, so they're already holding hands. So by 10.30, Cliff Davenport and Pat Benson... <laughs> were walking out towards the distant shimmering sea. Her hand rested in his. They spoke little. To an outside observer, they were just another couple going for a bathe. So, you know, I would say he shoots his scars, but he hadn't even had to shoot. He's just fallen in his lap. Because he's Cliff Davenport. Professor Cliff Davenport. Professor Chris Davenport. <laughs> so, they're, you know, they're checking things out. She started, uh, they started talking about how long they were both going to stay. And I felt it started getting a bit needy. Yeah. Even though it's like less than 24 hours since the met. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> How long are you staying here? It seemed as though there were a note of anxiety in her voice. Almost as, if, almost as if his answer would be of great importance to her. Yeah, a bit needy. Mm. That's what I thought. Yeah. So, anyway, they find more crab tracks. And they find fragments of shells. And he says, you can see for yourself how right you were. They must be as big as sheep. But why hasn't anybody seen them? Says Pat. For two reasons, I should say. Cliff paused and slowly filled his pipe, packing the tobacco down tightly in the bowl and then proceeding to light it. Firstly, as I've already mentioned, they've only just appeared on this part of the coast. Secondly, they move and feed at night, particularly when there's a full moon. But can't we advise the authorities? Pat spread her hands in despair. The army, for instance? Cliff Davenport laughed, but there was no mirth in his laughter. You could just imagine the sort of reaction we'd get, he chided, puffing out thick clouds of smoke. They'd be more concerned about the fact I took a peep at one of their pilotless aircraft through my binoculars than some tomfool tale that I thought there were giant crabs in the area. So, the, the pipe stuff, is it Guy and Smith or is it Sherlock Holmes? 
Guy and Smith was a heavy pipe smoker. Mm. So you write about what you know, I guess. Yeah. Thought, Pat snapped, there's no thought about it. It's a certainty. We need proof, he replied. Positive proof that will convince them, and I'm going to get it. How? I shall come back here tonight, he said, after the moon has risen. I shall be prepared for a long vigil. It may be futile. Probably it will be. The crabs may not show up here again for weeks. Once I've seen them with my own eyes, I'll be prepared to try and convince somebody, and maybe get some action out of some sort before more lives are needlessly lost. So he's, he's full-on engaged now, is Cliff Davenport. But also, it looks good towards her. He's very masculine, isn't he? Yeah. There's a lot of testosterone going on with all that that chapter and how he has to come back. He has to be the one to solve this. Yeah. And uh, and then they get down to some rumpy pumpy, don't they? Uh, well, actually, the spot of beach coma first. I was going to say, we've we come across Bartholomew. Yeah, we've come across Bartholomew, the, the beach coma. Matted hair, unkempt beard, reminded them of Robinson Crusoe. So he, he, he appears to be there purely in order for them to basically get surprised and go, oh, no, oh, no, it's just some old bum. And then, um, oh, of course, we've missed something critical. So, after he said that more lives may be needlessly lost, Pat says, we should watch from those dunes over there. Pat pointed back towards Shell Island. We'd be sheltered and we could see without being seen. We? I'm coming with you, make no mistake about that. Now look here, said Cliff sternly, grasping by the shoulders. This is no job for a woman. These creatures have claimed several lives already. They're deadly dangerous. The risks. I'm coming, she looked him straight in the face. And don't you try and stop me, Cliff Davenport. We're in this together. You weren't the only one to discover those marks. All right, he sighed. I suppose I can't stop you coming along, but you'll have to do as I say. We're just going to look. Nothing more. She nodded. Fair enough, she said. That's fine by me. Hey, somebody's coming. And this is where they spot Bartholomew, the beach coma. Yeah. So he's, he's, he's trotting around by the tracks and they decide to head back, but instead they find a hollow and sit and rest. And, uh, and basically they get down to it. So suddenly one <laughs> is crack, kiss her, crush his, hips against, crush his lips against hers, to feel her body pressed against his own, her breasts on his chest. So, yeah, we won't read out the rumpy pumpy. No, but can I just mention, because this, you know when lines stay with you? Yeah. So the line, let me think, it was, his loins were fully <laughs> charged with emotion. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I must say, as a woman, you wouldn't understand that. <laughs> yeah. Um, as, 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 as a man... That we, sounds like a piston yeah. rather than... As, a human body. As a man, we regularly reflect on how our lines are charged. <gasps> no, no, no. Charged with emotion. Oh, well, Don't yeah. forget that bit. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, God, my lines are charged with emotion right now. I think it's probably the White Russian. It's probably the extra vodka in the White Russian. I don't know. It's hard to tell. It's hard to tell at this time on a Sunday afternoon. 20 past one on a Sunday afternoon. Heavily vodka White Russian. Lines charged with emotion. It's just a regular Sunday. I and mean, I'm not even Cliff Davenport. We will talk about it more, but yeah, the sexual writings of Guy and Smith yeah. are something else. Yeah. So they've had a bit of rumpy pumpy in the dunes, and then they get back to uh, Mrs. Jones' private hotel after 11. And Cliff's got a sports jacket over his open neck shirt, and he's wearing flannels and pumps. How cool is Cliff Davenport? Pat's wearing a polo neck sweater and jeans. <laughs> they did not take the car, preferring the lengthy walk to Shell Island. So they got back, uh, sorry, no, it's after 11 when they leave the private hotel. So basically, they've had Rumpy Pumpy in the dunes, they've gone back to the hotel, they've had something to eat, and now they're heading back out again. Fully recharged. Fully recharged. And uh, she comments what a beautiful night it is, so he starts snogging her again. I've noticed the way it's like everything had gone quiet, like the town had gone to sleep yeah. before we started the next lot of Rumpy Pumpy. Yeah. And they feel like they're the last two people on Earth. So, once again, they settle down in a hollow, similar to that in which they'd make the known, made their feelings towards each other known that morning. And uh, and, and they, they properly get on at this point, and there are references to the hardness. Yeah, I, I was going to say, let's, let's break it down into Professor Cliff Davenport. Yep. His hardness, his warm moistness. Yep. Yeah, we've, we've got it all. We've got it all. Her fingers were active. Cliff felt that thrilling sensation of his zip being pulled down. 
her fingers groping inside the open vent, and then the coolness of the night air on his warm moistness. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing, but it's just... <laughs> he, get, he gets better. He gasped with pleasure. Pat Benson certainly knew what she was doing. Yeah, she it's was an experienced lady. So, um, you know, there's a little bit more. And this goes on for like two pages. There's a little bit more, but the, the, the choice bits are... Cliff withdrew his left hand from the warmth of Pat's sweater and felt for the fastener on her jeans. Then he pulled a zip down, and she lifted herself up slightly off the ground so that he could unclothe her. The whiteness of her thighs. First mention of thighs, there was a lot of thighs in the rats, weren't there? Mm. The whiteness of her thighs was in itself seductive in the soft moonlight. The darker triangle of soft, fluffy hair between them seeming to withhold secrets from him. So then it gets a bit weird. Secret of men who lay in there. Secrets of men who had lain there. Men who had been sexually satisfied beyond their wildest dreams. And of one man who had walked away in preference for another woman. So this is what Cliff's got thinking about while, yeah. while he's rummaging around in her pants. And I have to say, how does he know? She's 25 and yeah. she's been married. How does he know she's been with loads of men? Yeah. This is 76. Yeah. He's, he's automatically assuming she's a trollop. Because she knows expertly what to do with his manhood, with his man, with with his with his hardness, with his hardness. Yeah. So this this seems to be kind of a, a, a I should point out just because you've been sexually active by the age of twenty five, I should say that doesn't necessarily mean you're a trollop. Just take that back. Absolutely not. Yeah. But th- this is must have been a, a regular thing from these kind of seventies books: hardness, moistness, <laughs> soft triangles. We had, I don't think we had soft triangle in the rats, but I'm sure it's, in, it's either in Lair or the Fog. We'll find out in the Fog. And I have to say, as they came to climax, that it was they were finally convulsing in a violent eruption. Yeah. I'm sorry, but that's the most unerotic thing <laughs> I have ever read. Yeah. I, just, I just love the conclusion to it. Cliff Davenport, ever the pragmatist. It says, reluctantly, they parted and adjusted their clothing. Pat. Her hair awry and her cheeks flushed looked more beautiful to Cliff than ever before. I'm more than glad I'll let you come with me tonight, he whispered as he zipped himself up again. I'm afraid, though, that we must still keep an eye open for those crabs. Oh, what crabs? <laughs> <laughs> fucking brilliant. Yeah. It's like, right, we, you know, we've, uh, I've, I've, I've emptied off in you. Oh, yeah, we're here for crabs. Yeah. Then the sea crabs. Then the spot summit. So, basically, while they've been rumpy pumpy in, they see something. But it turns out it's Bartholomew. Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah, it's just Bartholomew. So for the second time, they see Bartholomew just after they've engaged in saucy behaviour in a hollow. <laughs> yeah, so Cliff pulls, pull, he pulls her back down into the long grass because he doesn't want Bartholomew to spot him. Can I just break in there? Mm. Having both come from seaside towns, I know yeah. I keep saying it, not once does he talk about the uncomfortableness of sex on the beach. No, true. Uh, maybe maybe guy was really really into sex on the beach. Mm. Yeah, maybe maybe it's just you know part of his animalism. There's a lot of naturists as well, isn't there? Yeah, true, okay. true. Yeah. Um, so the sea bath only, but then then the sea crabs. So literally within sixty seconds or two minutes of them finishing finishing each other off, uh, the giant crabs actually arrive. So at least it was timed well. Because yeah. it would have been rather embarrassing on two counts. Number one, if Bartholomew had happened upon them when they were mid-coitus. Mm. And number two, if the crabs had arrived and eaten all three of them while they were mid-coitus. I don't know. Maybe Bartholomew had said, can I join in? Then the crabs arrived <laughs> and saved them having to make a potentially embarrassing decision. Or to wake up afterwards, not to wake up, to open your eyes afterwards and to see all these... Crab eyes all around the dune. Yeah. Well, that's it. The crabs might just might be into watching. <laughs> so yeah, so they the get serious. They spot something. They spotted Bartholomew, and whilst they're relieved, the tramp didn't get an eyeful, and the crabs come ashore, including a big boss crab. And the crabs chase him down, and the boss lops his limbs off and tosses him to his gang. And th- this this is actually quite good fun. This um, because King crabs are quite scary. Actually. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's quite good fun because. The crabs come ashore and, and, and King Crab is like basically just directs them. And it's 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 actually really good fun because the crabs aren't just big and hungry. They're big and hungry. And actually this is the first indication you get that they're actually just a bunch of arseholes as well. <laughs> These crabs, the way they behave, they're, they're, like a, they're like a gang from a post-apocalyptic movie being directed by the villain. And uh, all the while Cliff and Pat are in the same spot were shagging, observing this. So, I don't know. 
it's probably a good job the crabs can't seem to smell hot, sweaty sex. <laughs> Otherwise, they've been in trouble. But, I mean, it's the fact they talk about this crab king. He seems so intelligent that he's almost human. But then they're, they're led by the scent of human flesh, yeah. which is why they're followed by Tholomew. Yeah. I mean, you say they're, they're, they're a bit of knobheads, but, you you know, if you were an animal out there, you would cut off all the limbs to stop your prey from... Well, true, yeah. It just comes across as mean-spirited. It... But perhaps there's absolutely an animalistic reason for it all. Um, and I suppose there's also another argument. The crabs might be able to smell hot, sweaty sex, but maybe smelling like seafood is the perfect clamophage. I can't believe you just said that. Yeah, notice I said, notice um, I accidentally said clamophage as well, not camouflage. Yeah. <laughs> oh, was it an accident? It was an accident, yeah. But I think I've just coined a new term <laughs> that the act of sex to put off giant crabs eating you is clamophage. <laughs> Let's just say that. Let's just agree that that's the case. Yo, oh, you could so be in Guy and Smith novel. Yeah, well, maybe maybe the secret, my secret is I want to be. Yeah, maybe. Um, so, chapter six begins. They're, they're stuck in the same spot, and all they can do is really lay low. How, how awful. The words came in a tortured gasp from Pat. She felt as though she was about to faint. She was glad of Cliff Davenport's comforting arm. Together they vomited into the spiky grass of the sand dunes <laughs> all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that bit, and I'm like, what? Together? <laughs> Together they vomited into the spiky grass of the sand dunes, all the time fearful that the sound of their spewing would be heard by the nightmare army of horrors from the deep. <laughs> I know, I was, I was like, it's spewing. It's just... Would you get that nowadays? Oh, I don't think it would. It's just brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. It's like from a really cheesy horror slasher movie and you're watching two people together spewing through the fingers. Yeah. Careful that the person who's killing everyone isn't looking. Yeah. And then you get this this brilliant thing, which... So, King Crab, the boss crab, is actually referred to as King Crab. So it says, The clicking began again, slower this time. King Crab's claw was in the air, circling slowing down like some pointer of doom seeking another victim. Instinctively, Cliff ducked, pulling Pat down with him. The pinter came round, faltered as it centred on the place where they lay hidden, then passed on. The two humans sighed with relief. They had not been singled out as crab food. The monstrous creature's claw came to a halt, pointing out to the sea. Immediately, the clicking began again. A mass of shambling, shuffling shells was on the move. Quickly, the incoming tide covered them as they headed back to the deep. Except King Crab. Only he remained after the rest had gone, almost as though he was reluctant to leave dry land, perhaps gloatingly surveying it as a possible future addition to his watery domain. So I just love the fact that all the, cla- all the crabs just gather around him, staring at King Crab, and King Crab is just like, waving his pincer in the air, uh, <laughs> this way, and off they go. It's just, it's just perfect. But it... It also denotes that although they're all like these huge, humongous crabs, that he's more intelligent, is a si- half a size again bigger than the rest yeah. of them. There's just something that he's much more mutated into something with much more intelligence. Yeah, yeah. So they uh, they head back to the B and B anyway. Um, after the crabs have buggered off back into the sea, they head back to the B and B. And uh, Cliff rings a buddy of his. And this is when I got mixed up between Grisdale and the other fella, Sir Rodney. Bradley. Sir Rodney Bradley. So he makes a phone call to London, the Ministry of Defence, to get another friend. And he says, I've already called on a friend of mine to get me out of a scrape recently. He would help me again, but I'm afraid he just isn't high enough. I must go right to the top. To the top. So, so Ronald Bradley ain't good enough. He's got to go even higher to the Ministry of Defence to one of his contacts because, of course, Cliff Davenport is anything if not connected. He's so connected. Yeah. So he gets in touch with his mate Grisdale. Putting through Grisdale back to puzzled expression, replacing the one of irritation. Clifford, he boomed the moment they were connected. What the devil's the meaning of phoning me at this hour? You what? Oh, well, I suppose I'll have to listen then. Go ahead. I'll try not to laugh. And uh, Cliff tells him all about the uh, the situation. So, so Grisdale sends Colonel Good because he's off to Belgium for top level talks. 
So he sends a colonel good down. He doesn't and, dismiss anything that Cliff says. He doesn't. He just sends a whiskey sotted buffoon of a colonel. Who he said you will hate him or yeah. something like I hate him. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what? Yeah. He actually paves the way by saying he's an idiot, he's sarcastic, I don't like him, you won't like him. He's on his way. Yeah, he really <laughs> doesn't sell this guy at all. So basically it's like it's almost like he's sending him as a joke. Yeah. So so he sends whiskey sotted buffoon Colonel Good to check things out, but sadly all, all Colonel Good wants to do is drink whiskey. So he fucks off to pub, gets pissed and goes to bed. Because the because the pl- Mrs. Jones's place isn't licensed. Yeah. Oh, how uh, disgusting. Absolutely is that? amazing. <laughs> so he's just not interested in Mrs. Jones' stuff. So he goes to pub. And Cliff and Pat go and they try and have breakfast with him just to just to try and mix get through to him that there is a real danger. Colonel Good, as it transpired, sat down to a late breakfast. Bleary eyed, he gazed venomously at his two companions, who had already progressed as far as the toast and marmalade. We've just been listening to the news, the professor leaned across the table. Two more swimmers have disappeared, this time as far north as Rill. What do you say now, Colonel? Huh. The Colonel began, began spooning his porridge into his mouth. People want to learn to swim before they start buggering about in the water. Bring back conscription, I say. Teach them all to swim. But it was it was obvious when he came back to the hotel the night before. Yeah. He was just wanted to sleep. Yeah. And he blamed it on whiskey as as to why Cliff was seeing these enormous crabs. Yeah. The man had no intention of believing this well, story. Well, he just wanted his whiskey, didn't he? Yeah. Cliff sighed and helped himself to some more marmalade. Now they were really up against it. His warning had gone unheeded. His first reaction was to head back to London himself, yet he knew he could not. He would have to see it through now. And besides, he wasn't going to leave Pat Benson on her own. Crabs or no crabs. They're a team now. They are a team, but why would you leave Pat? Yeah, you can't leave Pat Benson. Okay, I have just recharged our White Russians. So we're ready for Chapter 7, and we are midway through Night of the Crabs. So, in, in, in the first instance of something which happens a couple of times in this book, Colonel Good has buggered off, and nobody take, is taking the crab threat seriously. And Cliff Davenport is a little bit down in the mouth about the fact that um, it's not being taken seriously. And then literally, the very next page... All of that is undone because something happens to make everybody take it seriously. That happens a couple of times. There's no real payoff yeah. for Colonel Good just being a buffoon and not taking it seriously because the very next page, the cha- next chapter starts and the crabs attack the War Department drone base. I know. Mm. So they attack, they kill some soldiers, they go click, clickety click, 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 click. Do a bit of dismembering. They do a bit of dismembering and we find that they're, they're actually bulletproof. As well. Click, click, clickety click. The whole camp was awake by now. Someone had opened up the armory. Men with rifles were rushing to every available vantage point and opening fire. A battery of gunfire exploded. Click, click, clickety click. Hailstones or bullets. They were all the same to the giant crabs. They just bounced off. They did not like the sensation of having things vibrating on their shelves though. It made them angry. Very angry. Yeah. They didn't like the noise and the flashes either. Above it all though, they sense the prospect of sweet, tender human flesh. It reminded me of the Hulk. Mm. It made me angry. Yeah. Christ! The machine gunner in the tower swore he paused to reload. It hasn't bloody touched him. Might as well use a pea shooter. Suddenly, he had a cracking of timber below and felt himself and the machine gun starting to slide. They've wrecked the fucking tower! The sergeant screamed, and then they were sailing through the air, hurtling down to the waiting jaws and pincers. Oh... Yeah, they don't do so well, the the, uh, the soldiers, do they? Well, and all the while, King Crab is waving his claws, clicking loudly, and his minions... It says, King Crab waved his claws and clicked loudly. Instantly, his minions became silent, looking to him for orders, not daring to disobey. Half-eaten humans were forgotten. A wave of a great claw pointing to the shore. Retreat! Seconds later, the seaward shamble had begun. There were no obstacles in the way. The barbed wire fence had been flattened in the attack. So off they go again. They come in, they fuck everything up, 
and the bugger off. But it shows his intelligence, doesn't it? Getting them to break the bottom of the tower so the yeah. guards fall out straight yeah. to the waiting pincers and yeah. mouth. And then as soon as he realises they've been out of water long enough, tells them, right, back to base. Oh, yeah. Cliff Cliff twigs this later on, doesn't it? They only like to stay out of the water for so long. Yeah. So the best could do ram raids. They're like a bunch of ram raiding thugs. But it's not like any of them sort of go, oh, I need to go back in water and leave. Yeah. They only go back when King Crab tells them. Yeah. So, Grisdale's arrived now. Everybody's taking him seriously. He's apologising to Cliff Davenport and Pat Benson, saying sorry and that he should have believed in them. Cliff, on the other hand, is just drawing sagely on his pipe, just <laughs> nodding and saying, you know, we don't blame you. Cliff Davenport nodded. In front of him, he had a map of the Welsh coast spread out on the table. Let's start at the beginning, he said. We first saw these crabs a week ago. My nephew and his girlfriend disappeared the week before that, so we can safely say that these creatures arrived here no more than a fortnight ago. They're a freak species never before known in history. We can do little more than hazard a guess at their origin. Underwater nuclear experiments in another part of the world causing them to grow to tremendous proportions? That's just a theory of mine, but at this stage we're not so much concerned with that as how we're going to deal with them, if and when we locate their underwater hideout. There must be somewhere on this coast between Rill and Both, but where? There must be thousands of caves below the sea, which could hide a million of them. Personally, Grisdale interrupted, I think they bit off a bit more than they can chew when they attacked the WD base. Grisdale lit another cigarette. Perhaps they won't venture ashore again. Don't you believe it, the professor replied. They didn't suffer one casualty. They survived rifle and machine gun fire. Now there's a colossal crab which leads them. I've named him King Crab. King Crab. Believe you me, he thinks. He's cunning. That attack was more of an experiment than anything else. They've found bathers easy prey, and now they want to see how they fare on land. They've discovered that bullets can't hurt them, so next time they'll be much more venturesome. The invasion will be on a much bigger scale, and they'll hit one of the towns. Absolutely. If they've been hit by a... They've hit a military defence place, and they've thrown all of this at them, and they've not even been injured, of course they're going to try further. Yeah. I've got got to say, by this point in reading the book, and with, with Cliff Davenport's massive speech about how dangerous the crabs are and how he's named the leader crab, King Crab, yeah. and he's, he's fully in control of this situation. I am completely all on board with this book. And I've been I've been reading it for a while by this point, thinking I'm quite enjoying this, but now I'm just all in. I'm all in with Night of the Crabs at this point. And you're not even bothered that after that he goes back to her room and they all get jiggy-jiggy again? Well, obviously, you know, it's, 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 it's not just the case that... <laughs> we'll get to that in a second, because it's brilliant. It's not that just they get down to it. It's amazing, but <laughs> it's it's Cliff Davenport is just the fucking man you want when Rill is under threat from giant crabs. Yeah, and I don't know if it's too soon to slag off Rill or offend Rill because I think I did it in the last episode as well. But we've been to Rill, haven't we? Oh yeah. You remember Rill? Oh yeah. Now I would find it quite easy to believe that even when we were there, it was under threat from crab invasion, <laughs> possibly even post crab invasion. Post, yeah. People yeah. were very. Downcast, weren't they? Yeah, and uh, and yeah, that there were whole streets boarded up as though there'd been some kind of crab war. Yeah, <laughs> people were very lethargic, and they'd given in. They'd they? given in. They'd given yeah. in to, to. You could well imagine that their their giant crab overlords had already fully taken charge. Yeah, but in all serious, we love you, real, and we'll be back soon. We will. Yeah. <laughs> um. So anyway, they go back to the B and B, and brilliantly, they do get jiggy with it. But this one starts off ever so slightly different. Cliff goes up to Pat Benson's room and he finds her flicking a bean, doesn't he? <laughs> he walks in on her flicking a bean. Uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely crazy. But she's absolutely all right with it, though, and she says she was thinking of him anyway when she was doing it. Well, that's all right, then. Yeah, it must be the pipe. It must be the pipe. So they get down to it two times. Not one time, two times. Yeah, but you know why they got down to it the second time? Why? Because she was all needy again and... What's going to happen? Oh. You know, we're in, are we on about day three of them knowing each other? So she asks about the future. Yeah. And when he says he's taking her back to London, she was like, right, I'll have another go, see if you're up for it. Yeah. I suppose, thinking about it, for a new couple who've only been together three days, I think they've got down to it probably four times, and he's walked in on a masturbating. Now, for a general couple who've just got it together... That's actually pretty good going. But considering they're also dealing with a giant crab invasion at the same time, they've crammed a hell of a lot into those three days. Yeah. And they're living at 
they're staying at Mrs. Jones, who I don't think would take kindly to their rumpus. I don't know. She, she set them up. Maybe she's got hidden cameras. She set, she set them up, but they made a point of tiptoeing. Oh, that's he tiptoed true. to the room. He didn't want it known. Yeah. I, I just think she. I, I just think she's a wise woman of the world, Mrs. Jones. She knows what's going on. I think she'd like them to get together, but I think she's of an age where she'd expect people to court, yeah. not to go and yeah. what those two are up to. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But then again, she's running an old Victorian private hotel. I think she's a bit more savvy. Oh. I think she knows exactly what's going on. But Cliff Davenport has just got too much integrity to flaunt it. I, I think I'd have to disagree. Because he's Cliff Davenport. <laughs> yeah. I know he would want to flaunt it. But I don't think she would agree. Wow. Well, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, I don't know. Chapter I, I, eight. I, I think old ladies who run old Victorian <laughs> private hotels know the score. Uh, no offence to any listeners who are old ladies running Victorian private hotels. But if you are, you know I'm right. So we get on to chapter eight and we get our first vignette for a while. And of course, James Herbert has whole chapters of vignettes, didn't he? Vignette after vignette after vignette setting people up to die. Yeah. But actually, Guy and Smith uses them quite sparingly. I think that's quite good because James Herbert would have had another 60 pages in this book purely of vignettes introducing people just to get killed. Um, so but Guy uses them quite sparingly. So we find... Sam Owens. Sam Owens, night fisherman. Night fisherman. Strong, quiet bloke mm. who gets eaten by giant crabs. But he's actually a little bit disappointed by the manner of his own end. And i got to say, I did enjoy this. I thought this was kind of wonderful. I mean, he carried on going out at night because he, he felt he was a fisherman. He always he always fished at night. Yeah. He didn't have anything to worry about. He didn't have anything to worry about, but i tell you what, he was a pretty fucking low character when it comes to mood. Listen to this. Sam Owen caught a glimpse of the advancing creature through a red haze. Blind panic seized him. He staggered to the bows, blood still pumping fiercely from his severed wrist. He was going to die one way or the other. He would either bleed to death, or this nightmarish monstrosity from the deep would mutilate him and eat him. His thoughts turned to the sea. He decided that he would die in the way he'd always wanted to, with salt water filling his lungs and the fish which had provided him with his living feeding off his body. Yeah. I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> it's kind of cool, but it's it's a bit dark. Well, he's a fisherman. He's, he's, he's a fisherman, but you know, I would say 95% of fishermen want to meet their end... In an armchair at home with a bottle of ketchup next to him and two cans of McEwen Export and the family around him. He, yeah, well, he obviously wasn't that old. I mean, I've got fishermen in my family and obviously they had stopped fishing yeah. when they got older. Yeah. But he's still a fisherman. I suppose, yeah, we're both from fishing towns, yet I still maintain that whilst there's a dark kind of romantic angle to him <laughs> basically wishing that his end would be drowning and being eaten by fish, all dark romance aside... I would say 99 fishermen out of 100 would favour being on the piss on Freeman Street and having an heart attack. They would. Ryby Square. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, you've talked me about that. Yeah. But I don't think he actually thought that. Like you say, he romanticised it. And when at the end he realised, actually, I'm going to die, his way of coping with it so he didn't panic was, oh, well, this is how I said I wanted to die. Yeah. I think that's all it was to to reduce the panic. That's how I read it. Maybe, Maybe so. Maybe so, but I still think the rest of them would be going, for fuck's sake, I really thought I'd have an heart attack in Rainers. <laughs> how, how have things come to this? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, but anyway, we find out that Cliff was absolutely right at the end of that last chapter. It is invasion time, and they do invade a town. They invade Barmouth, and Barmouth gets fucked up, and the armies are dismayed to find that the crabs are not only bulletproof, they're tank-proof have a novel way of taking the tanks out as well. They pick it up and lob it in the harbour. Oh, so you said the tanks have a novel way of no. taking the tanks out. No, the crabs have a novel way yeah. of taking the tank out. They lift it up and lob it in the harbour. Yeah. Yeah, and all the men in the in the tank were like, no way they can pick this up, shit. Yeah. That's when they realise the extent of this problem. Yeah. But once again, King Crab's a bit cagey, and after the rampage like the pack of knobheads they are, they sod off again and piss off back into the sea. But before they do, I just want to say there was a burning beam that fell on a crab and it showed that they were impervious to fire. 
So they're impervious to bullets, yep. they're impervious to tank shells, they're impervious to burning beams, they're impervious to fire. Oh my god, what will end these crabs? Well, we'll find out. <laughs> and then King Crab obviously took them back into the... Yeah. He sounded the alarm. Time to click the click time to get back in. He does. And uh, I, I say we'll find out later, but we'll talk later about... We don't. We still don't really know that it works. But anyway, we'll get to that. No, no, let's, let's not spoil us. Yeah. So the only way to respond to this absolute nightmare at Barmouth and this terrible, terrible realisation that even the army can't deal with these crabs. They call a meeting at the time. They call a meeting at the time hall. Absolutely. Yeah. Because the best way to respond is a meeting. Always. And find out who's got a plan. Yeah. Well, who has got a plan, Phil? Would it be Professor Cliff Davenport? Of course. Cliff Davenport's got the plan. <laughs> so. But it's, it's Greasedale, isn't it, who does the talking? Yeah. Yeah. Inside the town hall, it was hot and stuffy. The men seated on either side of the long table sweated profusely. Outside, they could hear gangs of workmen attempting to clear the debris. The streets were crowded with holidaymakers who were intent only on viewing the results of the invasion. They constantly ignored police warnings to keep clear. Cliff Davenport loosened his tie and looked around him. He even put a tie on for the meeting. Whoa. Yeah. So it's a meeting. All men. He's wearing a tie. The mayor's there. The councillor's there. The top brass from the, the military are there. Gentlemen, Greasedale stood up and addressed the gathering. Last night, this town suffered an attack far worse than anything it has ever experienced in its history. We had anticipated a move of this sort ever since the invasion of Shell Island. The precautions taken were, it seemed beforehand, perfectly adequate. However, we had underestimated the enemy. It now appears they are immune to the weapons of warfare, nor, it seems, do they fear fire. There is, therefore, only one course open to us. We shall take immediate steps to locate their underwater hideout... Once this has been discovered, I have no doubt that they will be unable to survive the charges which will shall explode beneath the surface of the sea. It's funny, when they talked about setting charges, it's like, what about all marine life? Oh. I, I, I can't help it. Oh, it's Phil. Just... Phil. We've got to take out the giant crabs. We've got to take out the giant crabs. Collateral damage. I uh, can't talk about that right now. I know, I know. Yeah, I know. this is why there's no women at this meeting. <laughs> Watch it. <laughs> There's no real women because that's a really yeah. sexist meeting. Yeah. What about all the female marine biologists who are out there? Well, they're all secondary to Cliff Davenport, oh, aren't they? Or having babies. Yeah, or, or having babies. <laughs> yeah. Or, 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 he, or they've been sacked because they weren't making his breakfast. <laughs> so Greasedale continues. <sighs> we have among us, he went on, Professor Davenport, the well known marine biologist. It was he who first discovered the presence of these creatures on our shores, and he has agreed to collaborate with us in our attempt to exterminate them. I feel sure that his knowledge of the ocean bed will be invaluable to us in seeking out these terrible creatures. I would add that while for the moment their reign of terror is confined to this part of the coast, it could spread further. They will breed if they are not destroyed. Not only this country, but the whole world would be in peril then. A murmur ran through the listeners. Heads turned to look at Cliff Davenport. For once in his life, he felt slightly embarrassed. Proud, too. The safety of the human race lay in his hands. He was being asked to deliver them from this peril of the deep. It was one hell of a responsibility. It was one hell. But I have to ask, and it was a point that I remembered for myself, I get why he's proud. That's yeah. a huge thing, although it's a huge commitment. Yeah. Why was he embarrassed? Well, what, what I love is, it says, for once in his life... He felt slightly embarrassed. Yeah. So the one time in his entire life he feels embarrassed is when he's put on the spot and lauded as the saviour of humanity. Oh, because that caused his embarrassment. Because yeah. Cliff Davenport doesn't get embarrassed. <laughs> Cliff Davenport is immune to embarrassment. It takes something really fucking special. I get from his role that he's not used to dealing with common people. Yeah. He deals with all these high up... You know, other professors and the military and Sir Whoever. Yeah. But he's having to deal with the people who live there, the common yeah. folk. Yeah. No, I think he's just Cliff Davenport. Is <laughs> Cliff just... Davenport and he is like some kind of fucking hero of legend. I was just for some... Yeah, okay, okay. I was he... like, why are you embarrassed, Cliff? Because he's a hero of legend. Mm -hmm. So, the plan is in place. He's going to go diving. At the moment, it seems like Cliff is the only person who's going diving, but we found out there's more people doing it. We don't even know. Okay, so he's a marine biologist, but we don't know he can dive. No. 
Well, he can. He's a marine biologist. Yes. <laughs> but more importantly, he's Cliff Davenport. So, of course, he can dive. So, Cliff Davenport and Pat Benson hit the water so he can dive, go diving. She's very upset, obviously. She's very worried. She is. She is. But he's got this hunch, for whatever reason, that they'll all just be gathered together in a cave underwater. That makes sense. They'd have a lair. Makes some kind of sense that they would all just cuddle up with King Crab. It's really funny, actually, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking they've got a lair. It's like, the rats! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, his hunch that they're all just going to cuddle up in a cave with King Crab, well, actually, it turns out to be absolutely correct. Will he be right? Of course he's right. It's Cliff Davenport. Pat stepped up to Cliff and their lips met. He looked at her. Clad in sweater and jeans, she was the most desirable thing in his life. He thought about what lay ahead of him in the murky fathoms. Why did it have to be him? Why couldn't he and Pat go back to London and leave the authorities to deal with the giant crabs? He knew, though, that there was no other answer. He thought again of Ian and Julie. As soon as the creatures were destroyed, he could learn to live again. Fucking hell, Cliff. It's been like two days. <laughs> you know? It's been like, it's not like you've had ten years of PTSD because of the crabs. But no, after two days of crab action and getting his leg over multiple times, once he's done this task, he can learn to live again. And the other brilliant thing is, it's like, why did it have to be him? Well, of course it's got to be him. Yeah. Who else could it be? Who else could it be? So he spends a day or two diving, looking for caves. I have to say, and I remember thinking this at the time, that I was really pulled in on the description of this. Yeah. Especially when he finds the gigantic caverns. I just, I actually started to hold my breath a bit at times. Yeah, it was tense. That's because you've, you've formed a bond with Cliff Davenport. I might, I might actually get a little bit jealous. I might. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I just think bond is a bit of a close. I just, I wanted the work, I wanted to believe it. Yeah. Well, I'll fucking take up smoking a pipe. No, really don't. I hate pipe smoking. Well, unless you. If you continue to declare your unparalleled love for Cliff Davenport. <laughs> I haven't declared anything. I'm saying this part, I got drawn in. I, it's the writing that draws me in oh. of him when he finds this gigantic cavern. Yeah. Well, he hasn't found it yet. But it oh, says, okay. The following morning, they started their search immediately after breakfast. The night had been quiet, and along the Welsh coast there had not been a single alert. Maybe they'd given up and gone back where they came from, Pat remarked hopefully as Cliff donned his diving suit. I very much doubt it, he replied. It's the moon. As I've said before, it lures them out. Last night was moonless. Too much cloud, and the full moon's gone anyway. That doesn't mean that they won't attack in the night. It's just that the inclination isn't so strong. They might even attack in daytime if it comes to that. Then Cliff Davenport dived, aware that for the rest of the day he would spend many hours deep down in the murky depths. Other divers were searching as far afield as Colwyn Bay and Both. He feared, though, that inexperience might cause them to overlook the slumbering crabs. Because, you know what? Nobody's got the experience of Cliff <laughs> Davenport. Anyway, by some coincidence, they don't find it. He finds it. You're right. He finds the massive cave that they're all apparently a kip in. He was right. Of course he was right. Of course he was. But he gets trapped between the main lot and a sentry that wanders back in. Although for some reason, it doesn't eat him. And he manages to kind of stare, kind of obscured from it. He must have been very quiet, because mm. I know he'd looked over, shining his torch, and saw them all. Yeah. They didn't wake up, so they're obviously deep in sleep, yeah. like you say. Then the sentry wanders back in, but they all must be quite sedate at yeah. this point. Or he still smells of dirty sex. Oh, that's your yeah. conclusion. Yeah. I don't think it's that. He's effectively clamophaged. But anyway... Meanwhile, <laughs> I have no words. I'm sorry, listeners. Yeah. Meanwhile, on the boat, Pat's fretting. So Stan William gets in his kit and goes looking for him. I wonder how Stan Williams will fare. Oh, I really felt for Stan. I felt for Stan. He was a really good swimmer. He was a good swimmer. A diver. He had lightning fast reactions. Didn't he? Yeah. But just before the end of chapter nine, he gets confronted by a crab. So, chapter ten. Cliff just gets out on his own. So this is another one of those unusual things about about these this book. It's like, you've got this thing where Stan goes in the water. Stan and Cliff never meet in the water. Cliff escapes all on his own. Stan, gets, Stan, despite being a great swimmer, loses his leg to a crab. 
gets pulled on board a speedboat. But I don't know about you, but I couldn't work out the time scale of this. Yeah. So he walks over the crab, and when he walks over the crab, the boat's gone. Yeah. So which crab did Stan come across? Yeah. If not the one that's guarding the... Yeah, it's, it's a bit muddled, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's a little bit muddled. And and I think this, there's something else as well. It's like... So Stan gets his leg snipped off, unlucky Stan, but he makes it to the surface and gets pulled onto a boat, and he blurts, he blurts some info out about them being in the right place and the crabs are down there, yeah. and then dies. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, Grisdale's there. There's no mention of Grisdale being on the boats earlier on. It says there's five people on the boat. There's Pat, there's Cliff, there's the boat driver... And there's the two Ministry of Defence divers. I assumed, rightly or wrongly, because there was the boat that they're on, yeah. there's a speedboat which picked up staff. Which apparently Grisdale is on. But there's also the gunship. There's, I the, gun, there's the gunship. So, is he not on the gunship? No, they pull Stan Williams onto the speedboat and Grisdale kneels down next to him. Ah. So, so just yeah. weirdly, Grisdale has just been turning around on a speedboat. And it's, 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 all, it's all a bit weird. It's... It, I won't use the word sloppy, but there is definitely, and we'll talk about it later, there is definitely a sense with this that this is a book of two halves. Yeah, I mean, they they tell you there's a speedboat to pick up if something happens quickly, which they did with Stan. There's the boat that the five people are on with Professor Clifford Davenport. Yeah. And there's the the gunship to to blow them out of the water if they need to. Yeah, so it turns out that the, the fast response speedboat to get divers out of the water... Grisdale's on it. But they never... No, you're right. They yeah. never mention that. So, you know, he, he gets pulled on. Grisdale kneels down next to him. Stan Williams spouts his information, then dies. The crabs, the yeah. crabs, etc. So, meanwhile, Cliff has surfaced, but the boats are gone. So, wherever he's surfaced, who knows? And, you know, we'll talk about... There's more to come on that. So, after after that point, he has to um, swim to the coast and walk back to Barmouth, where he's a bit of a cock to a sentry. To be fair to Grisdale and everybody, they sent Stan down because they knew he was running out of oxygen in his tank. Yeah. Stan and the other diver on the boat knew how much time he had. So I, I understand that. Yeah. So when they brought uh, Stan back up and he died, they must have assumed the air had all gone. Yeah. Yeah. So Cliff Davenport gets back to shore. He's got a massive cob on because he think they've, thinks they've left him to die. The, the the timings don't really work for it. It's a bit odd. Um, no, no, because if if the timings were right and he then surfaced, you'd think he would see them in yeah. the distance yeah. driving so off. He gets back anyway. There's a shit to a sentry. Yeah. It says, without further ado, he pushed the startled sentry aside and mounted the wide stairs leading to the first floor. Across the landing behind the closed double doors was Grisdale's temporary headquarters. Cliff Davenport did not hesitate. Without even knocking, he pushed them open and entered. The occupants of the room whirled round, expressions of annoyance changing to incredulity. My God! Grisdale jaw dropped. It can't be. But it is. Thought I was a goner, didn't you? Cliff sneered. You didn't waste much time looking for me. We, um, we, uh... The Ministry of Defence boss gave up talking and just gaped. The words he sought eluded him. Where's Pat? Cliff snapped, his words cutting through the air like a whiplash. Come on, answer me, one of you. Where is she? She's been taken back to Lambert, Wildman answered. She's suffering from shock. I should bloody well think she is. There were seven or eight men in the room. For the most part, there were high-ranking officials from the armed forces. Every man jack of them just stood and stared, unable to believe that Professor Clifford Davenport stood before them, alive. But the thing is, it's like he knew at this point that they knew he was dead. Yeah. That they assumed he was dead. Yeah. He's just been a bit of an ass. Yeah, it's, it's been a prick. So Grasdale explains that poor Stan Williams came up missing a leg and and dead. So it was dead, so they just assumed he was dead as well. But this is where Cliff Davenport's legend starts to get a little bit shaky, I think. Because he makes a schoolboy error. He makes a true schoolboy error. So Grisdale suggests that a nuclear device should go to the cavern. Yeah. But Cliff's all like, nah, we'll just use a limpet man to collapse the cave mouth. Job done. We'll never get out. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see. All right, Cliff, if you say so. You are Cliff Davenport, after all. But we'll see if that works. And you would have thought, okay, he's this marine biologist, he knows loads. They would have other experts as well to cover all eventualities, but it seems to be just the Ministry of Defence and him. Yeah. Their fault. 
But he goes back to Mrs. Jones's Victorian private hotel. He's alive. And Pat Benson, of course, is delighted that he's alive. He explains, no, he's not a ghost. And then gently his hands began unfastening zips and clasps. And they get down to it. Oh, uh, again. Yeah. They get down to it again. So, you know, they're keeping up the record of regular loving whilst battling giant crabs. It's mm. a pretty successful relationship. Well, yeah. They're both honesty. happy enough, aren't they? Yeah. Do we then go on to chapter 11? We do go on to chapter 11. And chapter 11, it's time for the limpet mine. Set those mines. Will it succeed? Will King Crab get his own way? What challenges will he face? Well, none, because he's Cliff Davenport. So he plants the mine, and that's it. <laughs> it's success. It's just, and to be fair, he actually predicts it accurately. Because the chapter starts, it says, A sea mist hung over the bears the gunboat put out from Barmouth. This time there was no need for the launch or the speedboat. The mission was simple. Cliff Davenport would dive and place the mine. They would be back in harbour by the time it went off. In a way... It seemed almost like shooting a sitting rabbit. Pat Benson had remained behind at Clambert with Mrs Jones. For once, her insistence on accompanying Cliff had been overruled. There's no point, the professor told her. I should be back here well before lunchtime. As they dropped anchor, Cliff began donning his frogman suit. You sure you wouldn't like me to send Wildman along with you? Grisdale asked for the umpteenth time. Positive, Cliff replied. There's no point risking two lives. Not that there's any real risk. The crabs should be sleeping. But one never knows. And he turns out to be right. Job done. Can I just say at this point, so I felt it was ludicrous yeah. that the crabs had withstood the weapons, which included tanks, yeah. but they couldn't break up a few boulders. Hmm. You know, I said earlier on this is like a book of two halves, and I can't help but get the feeling that if Cliff Davenport is just bored of this now. <laughs> 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 which which you definitely get the feeling he is, yeah. then then Guy and Smith might be bored of this by now, and he's just trying to r- rapidly accelerate this to a close. So therefore, as, as a reader, it's quite hard not to be bored of it too. Although I did like the line when it when he was going down before he set the the mine, and he knew he knew it this time, and he knew where the lair was and everything. But it, it was like he was more anxious because. Every shadow seemed to hide a sleeping monster. Mm. Like that line. Mm. I've got I've got to look at any positive I can. Oh yeah. Now what one thing we've got to say, despite the fact that this is going a little bit downhill for me at this point, is Guy and Smith's writing, it moves at a real pace. Yeah. But it's good. You know? It's good, quick, snappy genre writing. And he's got a nice turn of phrase. You know, put aside Oh, not, notwithstanding all of the stuff about, you know, women met the supper, etc., etc., um, it does it moves at a clip. It's and it's entertaining. Yeah, it's entertaining. But I do just get the sense now that he's he's in the final stretch. I wonder if he's getting bored, as you say, or he doesn't know where he's going, which is what I possibly felt. a combination of the two. Yeah, possibly a combination of the two. So after an hour. Because they obviously they wouldn't hear anything when the mine went off. No, that's right. They just toasted yeah. him and Yeah, he, he goes and has a whiskey with Grisdale and then he heads back to Pat again. Ugh. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I shouldn't. Yeah. But it's her needing us again. Yeah. Well, Pat Benson sighed as she sipped a coffee over dinner that evening. I guess it's all over now. That's the end of the crabs for all time, I hope. Cliff Davenport noted the regret in her voice. He understood. It wasn't that she was in any way sympathetic towards the giant crabs. It's no, just no. it's just that there was no longer any common bond to hold them in Clambert. Now they could drift apart at any time they wished. Oh, that's so sad. Romance is truly dead when a giant crab invasion of Wales is the fire your relationship needs to flourish. <laughs> well, it's like when you start any new relationship, isn't it? It's like, what have you got in common that's going to keep you together? Yeah. With them, was it just the crabs? Yeah. Obviously, it wasn't the hot, rumpy pumpy that they'd been having. It was the giant crab invasion. Oh, that they both lost a partner. Yeah. For different reasons, yeah. but they were both lonely. Yeah. So, yeah, Cliff, Cliff is worried that they're going to drift apart without a giant crab invasion to keep them together. As so is she. Yeah. Doesn't last, though, does it? Doesn't last. No, they go for a walk, don't they? Yeah. So, But before that, there's a phone call. Grizzly, as Cliff is suddenly calling Grisdale... Latter stages of the book, we now know that he's got the nickname Grizzly. He's sent Davis down and the cave mouth has collapsed. 
Yeah. So hooray, the old thing. Job done. Naive Cliff. Too naive. Very naive. You thought you were all that and a bag of chips and scraps. He's let us down. Anyway, they go for a walk and Cliff proposes really, really clumsily. And she's like, oh yeah, when? <laughs> yeah, they've been together less than a week. Yeah. Not, yes, yes, I'd love to marry her, but yeah. when? Yeah, so, so once again, there's this like, potential suggestion of some kind of arc when it comes to, is there, are they going to drift apart? Is there a fracture in the relationship? No. No, I just needs to ask her to marry him. And she's like, yeah, when? Yeah. He's like, well, as soon as we get back to London. She, obviously, she wasn't spared by the fact that her last husband left her for another woman. Well, it's Cliff F in Davenport, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. It's Cliff Davenport. But, but, because this is the nature of this book, number one in this chapter, first thing is, assumption that it's all over. Second is, worry that they'll drift apart. Well, second one's resolved, because he asked her to marry her, and she's all over it like a rash. And the other bit... The spot giant crabs about 35 seconds later coming out of the ground on they a hill. Found, they found another way out. Yeah, so it's not over. And we know it's not over because, after all, there's still three chapters left. But before we go on to the next chapter was the fact that they had to postpone the wedding. I'm yeah. like, had they set a date? That's right. It's like, oh. Well, he did, he did say as soon as we get back to London. And it's like, oh, well, we might not, might not get back to London for a couple of days now because the giant crab invasion yeah. is still going on. <laughs> yeah. It's just amazing. It's like, oh, so we're going to go from getting married in 10 days to two weeks. Yeah, yeah. And But we are now on this. This is just rapidly accelerating to a conclusion now. It is. And, um, chapter 12. So, so chapter 12, nobody sees the crab for a week. They're laying low until an unfortunate dream-plagued train driver. I really felt... <laughs> die. I, I really felt for die. Yeah, poor die, who regularly dreams of having horrendous train crashes on a bridge near Arthog, has a horrendous train crash on a bridge near Arthog. And he was so close to retirement. He was so close to retirement. And uh, so, so he, sees, he sees crabs on the bridge and thinks, right, I'll just, I'll put my foot down. <laughs> and it all goes horribly wrong because the crabs are pretty much train proof as well. <laughs> for everything. Yeah. Proof. And uh, the entire train and all its passengers end up in the estuary and they all get eaten. And then some lifeboats arrive and the crews all get eaten. What a horrific turn of events. Chapter 13. <laughs> Have you moved on in the chapter? Hold on. Well, that's, that's pretty much chapter 12. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> chapter 13. Yeah. Any observations on chapter 12 beyond that? <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> chapter 13. Poor Grisdale is having a bit of a crisis of confidence. They were in the estuary all the time, Grisdale banged his fist on the table. While we've been scanning the shore with troops and laying heavy artillery placed along the coast, they've been lying low in the estuary. He looked at Cliff Davenport and shook his head. This fog isn't helping either, he groaned. Of all the times to choose, a sea mist has to descend upon us now. That's what King Crab was waiting for, the professor commanded. He's the most cunning enemy the world has ever met. <laughs> that was the line I thought I was mentioned as well. Yeah. That's such rubbish. Yeah. He's the most cunning enemy the world has ever met. This 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 giant crab that points. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, that's what King Crab was waiting for, the professor commented. He's the most cunning enemy the world has ever met. And he doesn't intend to confine himself to the Welsh coast alone. I'd stake my bank balance on that. What can we do? was despairing Grisdale's voice now as he gazed out of the window of his hotel room onto the promenade. The swelling mist hid the sea from his view. There's an emergency meeting at half past two. All the top brass. The troops and munitions are already on the way. But are they going to be any good against these bloody crabs? I'm afraid not. Cliff drummed on the desk with his fingers. Somehow, somewhere, there must be an answer. They just can't be totally invincible. They must have an Achilles heel. It's just a question of finding it. This meeting's going to be awkward. Grisdale put in. I've worked night and day, collaborated with all the armed forces, but everybody's saying Grizzly isn't doing anything. Quite frankly, I just can't think of anything except a nuclear bomb. And that just isn't on. It's not on. Even though I kind of think early on, was it not on about something similar in the war? It's just not on, is it? And, and you know, to be fair to Grizzly, there is nothing worse than an awkward meeting. Is there? No, there isn't. That's yeah. very true. So, there's some more Arthog shenanigans, more death and mutilation, more horror as the Crab Army emerges again on a raid, and some more dudes get killed, some more brave dudes who are trying to get to the boats and repair the bridge. 
And I, and I think the bit that he describes about the mist dispersing and going into the train wreck and the lifeboats and yeah. everything and finding no clues, of, yeah. no sign of any bodies. Yeah. That's, that's actually, quite it's, good. It's actually, it's actually pretty good. It's pretty yeah. descriptive. It's pretty nice. Um, but meanwhile, while all that really good stuff's going on, yeah. Cliff Davenport and Pat Benson are just strolling around Barmouth Harbour reading the paper. So apparently oblivious to the carnage at Arfog. But it's a good job because the paper, it turns out, holds the solution. And with about four pages of this book left, they happen upon the solution completely by accident by reading an article in a newspaper. Yeah, if Pat Benson hadn't been there and said, no, I was just reading that bit about that poor child who yeah. died, an eight-year-old who, who drank weed killer. <laughs> yes, yeah. so it's like, what's, what's that article? She's like, oh, yeah, what a terrible shame. He's like... Bing! And a light bulb goes over his head. <laughs> so, well, you're at this point, it's like, you're four pages from the end of the book and you're thinking, I know this is accelerating to a rapid conclusion, but bloody hell, guy. And anyway, so the crabs come out in force, the army retreats, there's no stopping them, then Cliff turns up in an helicopter and sprays him with weed killer, the bugger off back into the sea, the end. Yeah. I was so disappointed. <laughs> I can't tell you how disappointed. And because I read the book... <laughs> Before you, yeah. I couldn't share. Well, we haven't shared it till now. Yeah. I was so disappointed. Yeah. And I couldn't tell you. Yeah. And it is a disappointing conclusion. All the more disappointing because he has this assumption that the weed kill will kill them slowly. But they don't see any of them die. Nope. And King Crab directs all of his minions back into the sea, follows him into the sea and disappears. Well, and they kind of say that when the weed killer hits them, it starts to eat away at them straight away. They go straight into their, their shells, and had they done that, they would have died where there was. But King Crab snaps at them all, yeah. makes them all go back into the sea. So we don't know if the seawater saved them. No. And even, <laughs> even the King Crab, who at the end is stood there where they double douse him. Yeah. Body and face and everything goes back into the sea. Yeah. So th- there's there's a little bit of observation between Grisdale and Cliff Davenport where there's some arm wavy reference to a giant crab version of an elephant's graveyard where they all go to die. Yeah, that's bollocks. <laughs> I am. So, I feel cheated. I am yeah. so cheated because yeah. I invested in this. Yeah, but they have a a, a, a slightly philosophical ending. Whereas, uh, but Grisdale says, "Well, I've I've got a, we don't want a second crab war, but I've got to go to Belgium again tomorrow evening for some important business." Pat says, "Don't forget to be back in town for the wedding." I won't miss that. He laughed. So long as there are no crab sandwiches at the reception afterwards. <laughs> no fear of that. Pat grimaced. I never want to see another crab again as long as I live. It's, Ugh. It's so ruined the end. Yeah. I was gutted. It's it's not a quality ending. I've got to say, but it is the ending. And it's the only ending we've got. <laughs> it's a short book, and it's and it packs a lot into those hundred and forty yeah. odd pages. Sorry, yeah. my book's a lot long bigger yeah. because of the page size. Yeah. Well, but, if there is any doubt in our minds as to whether the crab survives, King Crab, there are about another ten crab novels. Is this the first? This is the first one. Right. So yeah. you, you either obviously I've not read the second one, so either. Some of them survive and breed. Yep. Or we have another outbreak. Because we don't know yeah. where they come from. Well, I, I do know that... I, I've, I've not got the next one in the series. But I have got Crabs the Human Sacrifice. And I bought it purely for the cover because it's fucking hilarious. <laughs> because it's a picture... It's a painting of an altar with a cross on it and a crab in front of the altar holding a sacrificial knife. I've seen that. Which I think yeah. is a wonderful cover. Um, but that is set on the East Coast. And I think it's partially Norfolk and Lincolnshire. Not so, bizarre. Yeah, so we really need to read that. <laughs> we really need to read that because, uh, you know, that's that's close to our neck of the woods, isn't it? I kind of, I have to say that I would read it purely because I want to know, does it start from fresh yeah. or have some of these survived? Yeah. Because I am so cheated from this. Yeah, yeah. We'll um we'll be uh having a chat to to Graham aka Open Sussex who is the biggest massive guy and Smith obsessive I currently know, and uh, we'll I'll be talking to him during the week and we'll probably put that out as a 
a, a little extra and a patron exclusive, and I believe he's read lots of the Crabs novels. Can I be part of that? Of course, you can be part of that. I have. I am feel invested enough. Yeah. Yeah. From reading this. Yeah. So we'll get on with Graham, um. But first up, we need to just draw together our conclusions about Night of the Crabs and some broad observations. So I'll go first, <laughs> because this is really a book of two halves. And for me, it's pre-chapter 9 and post-chapter 9. In the build-up to chapter 9, it moves at a pace. It moves, it's, it's real snappy. It's super entertaining. But post-chapter 9, it's like there's just a slight element of everything. The pace increases. Cliff Davenport becomes less of an engaged protagonist. It's all too easy for him. He doesn't really face any peril. Even when he's in the water and he's kind of penned in... And, and the giant crab. It's not like he's in a situation with Stan Williams. That Stan Williams gets in where he has to escape the crab. The crab just doesn't see him. Mm. And it's it's just all too easy for him. Yeah. You know, there's no real peril for, for our hero. No, even when he even when he walks over it and brushes yeah. it twice, yeah. it doesn't wake up to him, does no. it? And it? And even at that point where they're in Arthog and everything's kicking off in Arthog, he's, uh, he's not even there. He's, walk, he's, he's walking around the harbour. With Pat Benson reading the paper, so yeah, it's it's a bit it's a bit odd the second half. So, any observations from you before I move on to my next one? So, I mean, I very early on had to tell myself it was written in seventy six, yeah, just because of some of the the writing and the 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 kind of sexist remarks and yeah. how it was. It's of its time. It's of its time, but also. You t- you put that aside, I, you know. I've we've both been reading it separately, but a, on a couple of occasions you've been giggling. Yeah. And the last time I wondered if it was the bit where he kind of tell he shooed her off. Yeah. And told her to to make herself scarce for half an hour, and I can't remember yeah. the wording. Yeah. But at the time I was like, oh, seriously, Cliff. Yeah. It's it's very of its time, and we have the same thing with the rats, didn't we? Where the protagonist in the rats pats a bottom and she goes off to make him breakfast before she goes to work. But. In the rats, the school teacher yeah. was looking at fifteen-year-olds. You know, you didn't have that in this. No, um, the the rats. The, there was some ever so slightly more queasy stuff in the yes. rats. There was none of that here. Whereas this was, you know, a, 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 a kind of a an old-fashioned pipe smoking marine biologist. So you know, yeah. And and I could buy it, and I really did, and I was just so saddened by the ending. Mm. I think that's my main conclusion, really. Yeah, and and so going back to the mysterious drone base, there's no payoff. No payoff at all. Is there? So it's set up early. We have the invasion of the drone base, and then it's never mentioned again. So that's that's a bit odd. It's mm. like there's there's no payoff there. And I like the idea that this is a book from 1976 and you've got an RAF drone base. It's not called a drone base, but that's essentially what it is. Yeah. And, and, and it would be great to know what caused these giant crabs to be. Yeah. We were never going to be told, was no. we? I'm, I'm sure with another 10 or so books in the series, we may <laughs> well find out. Do we have to read them all? Yeah. Uh, well, no. You just said yeah. <laughs> we, we, we don't have to read it for the podcast because it's a year again before we do another Halloween episode, and I'm I'm sure we'll. Um... We're not doing the crabs for the next one. No, no, we've um, got to mix it up. We're we're, we're going to do the fog as a patron extra, yes. but next year we'll we'll put it out to a poll again and we'll see what comes up. So, what what's your overall conclusion then on Night of the Crabs? It's a short book, so I would encourage people to read it. It yeah. was an enjoyable read, taking aside all the fact of when it was written. Yes, the ending was a letdown. Because how many times we've watched a film and gone, oh, that's going to result in a in a next book, uh, yeah. in a next film because of how they've left it. Yeah. Maybe he'll get better at that. That's mm. my only downside. So if you don't mind that, yeah, there is a lot in it that's quite kind of enjoyable. Mm. Yeah, I, I would say the same. I, I think it's 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 really fun until it isn't. But <laughs> but but even then. You can't let the last five chapters ruin everything that came before. Because the last, the last five chapters are a little bit disappointing. Had you had the scenes in Arthog and Cliff Davenport be there and have some hair-raising situations and be involved mm. as the protagonist, I think it would have it would have worked better. Better, you know? yes. But what you end up with is, is some vignettes where Cliff's not involved and where, whenever Cliff is involved, it's just too easy. You know, There's no real peril for him. And I agree with what you said about... 
it's almost like he'd had enough of it. Yeah. I still think it was also, it's like, I don't know what I'm doing at the end. Yeah. Which is why Pat Benson read this article. He should have come up with this. Yeah. This marine biologist should have come up with yeah. what would yeah. have killed them. Not see it accidentally in a paper. Totally. Yeah. That's the bit that bugged me most. Yeah, so we, we criticised to some degree the solution in the rats because it turns out that this school teacher somehow has um, the knowledge to create some sonic weapon to deal with the rats, which... Which was just silly, <laughs> yeah, and thrown together as a last minute conclusion, and and actually this this is different but similarly disappointing, you know. There's there's nothing to do with the ingenuity of the characters that solve the problem, you know. So yeah, it's fun until it isn't, but it's a quick read. You can take the rough with the smooth and on balance. It's a very entertaining book. Absolutely. And and what makes it less disappointing is that, you know, we've done previous episodes. Tash dubbed The Jewel in the Skull a one-shit book. <laughs> and yeah. later on, we did an episode on Danis, the Dark Straits of Regulathium, as the first of what we intended to be a, a, an irregular series of one-shit book episodes. Well, actually, think, I think what we've done completely by accident with our Halloween 2021, 2021 episode is we have identified a pretty good one-shit book <laughs> because... You could read this on one long visit to the throne and be thoroughly entertained by it. I haven't read the books that you and Tash have read, so I don't know yeah. on levels of shitness. Yeah. But I've kind of enjoyed both our Halloween well, experiences. Yeah, the, the, the thing with Jill in the Skull is a one-shit book because it's a short read, but it's a good book. Whereas Danis isn't a one-shit book. It's just a shit book. And that's the difference. Uh. Yeah. You see, when we read The Rats, I had a few years ago, I tried to get my nephews to be readers. Yeah. I love to read, so. And I had actually bought in The Rats because I remember as a, as a teenager, I loved it. Yep. And then when we did it last year, I remember thinking, oh shit, why did I buy him that pile of shit? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it, it got into horror films, hadn't he? So yes. you So you made the jump and, tr- and tried to send him. Because we, we got him a box set of horror movies. We got him a John Carpenter box set when he was like 16, 15, yeah. or something like that. And and he and he dug a lot of that. Yeah. Um, so we tried to go to the next logical step, was, which was we've got him a lot of films that we loved back <laughs> in the day. Let's get him some books that we loved back in the day. Yeah, that was possibly more of a stretch. And I don't know, I don't know if you're listening, Jack, but I don't know if you ever read it. I doubt it. Yeah. Because <laughs> he'd have probably said, why the fuck did yeah. you buy me that? What, what, what the fuck is this, Auntie Phil? This is just... Mental, yeah. Well, you know what? Um, it was it was a lot of fun. Yes, it was. It was the top of the pops with the patrons, um, but I think it will be uh, an interesting read. Looking at the fog, not just because we're picking it up after doing this, but also because I think it was James Herbert's second book after the Rats, and the Rats reads like someone's first novel, mm. as entertaining as it is. The Fog was his second novel, and from memory, is a more accomplished book. I've never read it, so I'm really uh, looking forward to it. Yeah, so uh, we'll do that over the next couple of weeks, and we'll put it out as a patron extra. Excellent. Mm. Happy Halloween, everybody. Yep, happy Halloween, everybody. We now have to finish our second White Russian. I am now feeling it after our vampires case and our two massive, double spooky, double vodka White Russians, and uh, we're going to get some into more. That doesn't even make any sense. <laughs> I am no longer speaking proper English like what I should do. <laughs> so, happy Halloween, everybody. Happy and Halloween. we will see you next time. Thanks, as ever, to Phil for being so tolerant of my ridiculous obsessions and getting involved in this podcast. We had a great time, and I have a pretty thick head from all of the White Russians. But I need to get through this so I can carry on and we can go and watch some cracking horror movies. I've no idea what those are going to be, but let's get to it. So thank you, as ever, to our patrons. And starting off, those peerless patrons without tear, who are Tim Cardos, Sebastian Weetabix, and Anthony Piconti. And to our chaos engineers, Tony Malazzo, Simon Robinson. We've got to finish Wheels of Terror, Robbo. Simon Perrins, Neil Clapperson, Matt Saltz, Mal Pertwee, Jules Lawrence, John Timothy Watt, John Lays, Jim Kirkland, 
Fred Keish, Dave Washman, Dave's second Sonus album will be out shortly. I'll let you know when that's coming up. I can't wait to get my hands on that. Benjamin Fletcher, Anthony Porter, Andrew Van Ness and Andrew Cicluna. And to our Jugaderos, Tom Murphy, Graham Holden, Miles Riedelbatter, Matthew Broom, Taylor, Loz, Ian Stead, Craig Ledley and Alexander Harris. And of course, to our mighty patron demons, who are Joe Monty, Will Jameson, Bob McMillan, Randall Gatlin, Norman Beresford, Get Well Soon Norman, Neil Burton, Mortmain, William J, Laps Gamer, Gareth Wilson, Ed Scott, Andrew Clark, and, joining the ranks, Derek Clunan, a.k.a. Imria, the experimental bleak electronic artist who's featured on this podcast previously. Check him out on Bandcamp. He's knocking out incredible tunes and also some pretty groovy Halloween ones too. So thanks everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to have you all on board. And just as a tip, Ed Scott sent me some of the artwork for Volume 2 of The Journal and hopefully we'll be getting that finalised over the next month or so. So patron demons, you'll be getting that in the mail, hopefully before Christmas, and everybody will get the PDF copy posted to this Patreon site. So watch out for that. It's been a really, really kind of inspiring journey doing Volume 2, collaborating not only as always with Nan Soundtracks, but also with Ed on some new artwork, and of course with Sam and Perrins on an all-new portrait of a slightly more worn and million sphere battered Gerard Arthur Connolly. So you can follow us on Twitter and on Instagram on the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email us on breakfastruins at outlook.com. The blog is at breakfastintheruins.com. We have our Patreon page and there are a few Patreon exclusives on there. And all I'll say is have a very, very happy Halloween, no matter when you listen to this, because it's never too late to get spooky. And have a wonderful evening. And I'll see you all soon on the Moonbeam Roads. Mm-hmm.